I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled From AI to Social Learning, Instructional Design for Modern Learner Needs. So this session is being recorded and the archive will be posted to our on demands recording page, um, as well as on our YouTube, and we'll be sending out a link as well after um, it has been processed. So my name is Claire Alkire, and I'm a program coordinator here at UCI Division of Continuing Education. Here is a brief outline of what we're going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of Zoom features so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about our e-learning instructional design certificate program, which is a fully online program. I will cover the requirements, fees, and details regarding upcoming courses for our spring quarter, which begins March 27th. And I will then turn it over to our guest presenter, Dominic Kaloya. At the end of his presentation today, we will have a brief Q&A session. Finally, I will leave you with my contact information so you can send over any additional questions we didn't address. So if you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to John and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Dominic regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel as well and we'll address it at the end if we have time. Please be sure to send your questions to all panelists and attendees. So let's take a moment to warm up the chat panel. For everyone logged in, if you could please go ahead and introduce yourself, let us know where you're logging in from today, your job title slash company, and what industry you work in, that would be great. I'll give you a minute or two to do that, and then I'll move on. Thanks, Susan and Victoria. It's Claire, lovely name. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. Great. Okay. Keep on uh, typing that in, and um, Dominic will keep an eye on that as well. So here is a brief overview of the e-learning instructional design certificate program. Our program provides the knowledge and skills needed to develop and deliver training online. Taught by industry experts, the program will help you become proficient in all aspects of e-learning, including the design and development of interactive lessons, project management, evaluation and assessment, and more. As a student in the program, you'll get hands-on experience with our learning management system, take part in online learning community forums, receive individualized feedback from instructors, and have the opportunity to network and learn from others in the field. Our program is designed for a number of audiences, individuals who are completely new to e-learning instructional design or already have some experience, instructional technologists or education technologists, training coordinators and managers, human resources professionals, and teachers and other career changers. With the strategic switch to remote and online delivery, companies have prioritized e-learning as they recognize the value of training online. In order to be successful in our certificate program, students should be comfortable navigating software applications and learning management systems. The certificate program is composed of six required courses, which add up to 15 units total. To be eligible for this certificate, students must complete all six courses with a letter grade of C or better, as well as a completed declaration of candidacy and request for certificate form. Since there is a small candidacy fee, I would advise that students take a few courses in the program before they declare, just to make sure they want to complete the full certificate program. So as I mentioned before, our certificate program consists of six online courses. The required courses are listed below. Principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, project management for e-learning professionals, e-learning evaluation and assessment, and the e-learning instructional design practicum. Each course is 2.5 units and will run for eight weeks online. We highly recommend that students start off with the principals class and follow the sequence of courses as shown on this slide. The curriculum has been developed to flow from one course to the next, so taking the courses in this sequence is beneficial. Please note that there is a prerequisite for the practicum course. You must successfully complete all other required courses before enrolling in the practicum. 
At the bottom of this slide, I've also listed a supplemental course that may be of interest to you. Creating your online e-learning portfolio is not part of the certificate program requirements, but it is a wonderful opportunity to help you advance your career or become better situated for your job search. It is open enrollment, so anyone may enroll, even if you are not enrolled in our program. This is a five-week long instructor-led course that takes participants through the entire process of creating an online portfolio from defining the target audience and picking a tool through creating a polished website to share samples. Our program offers an Alternative Digital Credential, or ADC, within two courses in our certificate program. Students will have the opportunity to earn an ADC through successful completion of a qualifying assignment within either the Designing and Developing Interactive e-learning courses course um, or the e-learning evaluation and assessment course also referred to as a digital badge and ADC is a virtual record of specific skills and competencies acquired and provides a verifiable way to share your educational achievements with others via channels like Facebook LinkedIn and Twitter badges help demonstrate your commitment to professional development and help you stand out in a competitive job market I've included links if you're interested in learning more about ADCs in general, these specific ones in interactive e-learning, storyboarding, and level three evaluation behavior analysis proposal, and I've included the actual badge images on this slide. In the upcoming spring 2023 quarter, we are offering principles of e-learning instructional design, exploring e-learning development tools, designing and developing interactive e-learning courses, and e-learning evaluation and assessment. Each course is listed with its start and end date, as well as the online course fee of $680. Enrollment is currently open, and students may enroll either online or over the phone by calling our, stu calling our student <clears throat> services office at the number provided. We encourage students to enroll early as classes fill up quickly. Each required course in the program costs $680, so you're looking at a total of $4,080 in course fees for the six online courses. You don't have to pay the entire total up front. You would simply pay for each course individually at the time of enrollment. There's also a $125 certificate candidacy fee for the program. So in the end, you're looking at about $4,205 for the entire certificate program. Please note as well that that amount does not include textbooks, which some courses may require. Textbook information is posted on the enrollment pages, so you'll know if course materials are required before you enroll at a class. Prior to enrollment in the practicum, students must purchase or otherwise have access to and gain working knowledge of and authoring tools such as Articulate 360, Adobe Captivate, or other. So therefore, software may be an additional expense. Additionally, please note that in summer 2023, the course fee will be increasing to $690 per course. So if you're considering the program, spring might be the perfect time to start. I'd also like to specifically point out information about a special discount we offer for the program. We offer 10% off course fees to members of ADT, San Diego, Orange County, and Los Angeles chapters. If you are a member of these chapters, please visit the chapter website for more information. And this slide contains information about the articulation agreement we have in place with University of San Diego to provide you a next step on your educational pathway. After completion of our e-learning instructional design certificate program with a grade of B or better in each course, USD has agreed to accept our coursework as six units towards their fully online Masters in Learning Design and Technology. If you're interested in learning more, please visit the website linked on this slide. Here's a screenshot of our online course schedule, which has the most up-to-date information. You can enroll in any available courses by clicking the green online button. That to be scheduled indicates when particular courses are scheduled to be offered, but enrollment just hasn't opened yet. So as you can see, we don't offer every course every quarter, so you will definitely want to plan ahead. So at this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest presenter, Dominic Kaloya. Mr. Kaloya developed the learner intelligent adaptive design model for creating personalized learning experiences without AI. When he was a senior instructional designer for Johnson Controls, Dominic trained and supported instructional design teams. Dominic is currently a learning solutions and an engineer at ELB Learning, where he demonstrates innovative learning solutions, frequently integrating a variety of technologies and services. We're very excited to have him logged in today to present on a topic from AI to social learning, instructional design for modern learner needs. Now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dominic so he can begin his presentation.
Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much. And thank you for a great introduction. And I thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, today's approach is going to be a little bit different. It, we're going to take a high level approach. And I'm going, be, I'm going to be talking about what is systems thinking, and which is for some people maybe kind of like a macro view of the industry. And I'm going to relate that to three levels in the industry. If you're thinking about coming into the industry, if you're currently an instructional designer, or if you're involved in a larger scale, possibly managing a what is systems thinking? The easiest way I can explain what systems thinking is, it, I recall, I can recall a time when I had to get new tires for my car. Full disclosure, the illustration you're seeing is not my car. I was driving a Ford C-Max hybrid vehicle. And one of the reasons why I chose a hybrid vehicle was fuel economy, efficiency, saving money on gas. And when I had about 75,000 miles on the car, I needed new tires. When I went to price the tires, back here, when I went to price the tires, the manufactured tires were very, very expensive. But I could get brand name tires, the major manufacturer brand name tire for a lot less money. Now, keeping in mind my goal, cost, efficiency, which tire do you think I chose? Now, the illustration you're seeing on the slide, remember, I'm not replacing the wheels. So we're not choosing from these nice bronze looking wheels to the silver wheels, but which tire do you think I would get? The brand name tire, which would cost me a lot less money, highly rated, or the original manufactured tire? I see one person in the chat said the brand tire, my response is, yes, I purchased the, a brand tire, not the manufacturer's tire. And it wasn't long after I made the change that I noticed a serious decrease in gas mileage. And when I thought about it, the only change wasn't in my driving habits, it wasn't in the climate, it wasn't in the geography, the only change was the difference in the tires. And that's when I realized that the manufacturer carefully selected each element of this vehicle, fine-tuned it for maximum performance. And by my changing just one element on the car, I was not performing at peak performance. And wow, I never knew a change in tire could actually affect the car's performance, but it did dramatically. This is an example of systems thinking. When you, instead of thinking of items like the tire in isolation, if you think it, think of it as being functioning and relating to other parts of the system. So in this case, the system is the car and the one particular item is the tire. I was viewing it in isolation, thinking a tire is a tire, not understanding that the tire is fine selected finely tuned to working with all the other elements to provide peak performance. Now, the question is, how does this apply to instructional design? Level one, if you're planning a career, typically you think about what do I wanna do in life? What kind of job do I wanna have? And after a certain amount of thinking and talking to people and, and, and doing some research, you think, I think I would like to be an instructional designer. After you make that decision, there may be a certain amount of learning to take place, college courses, taking you know, credit courses, gaining some experience. And after you learn how to do the instructional design job, you put in an application, and then you get a job as an instructional designer, goal accomplished. There's nothing really wrong with this process. It's something that we all follow. However, a systems approach broadens your perspective and has you think about some other things. The, your, not only your goal, but what you have and what you need to get and where they all merge, the area right here in the center, that's the sweet spot. That's where you're thinking about all different aspects of the system. Well, for example, your goal, get an instructional design job. Well, how does things like your age play into effect. 
am I looking to become an instructional designer at the age of 25 and possibly doing it for the next 50 years? Whoa, no one, no one wants to think of doing the same job for 50 years. What's your timeline? Do I want to get a job quickly in the next six to nine months? Or is this something that I'm willing to invest three, four years in preparing for before I go into the workforce? Why do I want an instructional design job? Is it for the money? Well, that's going to impact your decision because you're going to be looking for instructional design positions that pay a lot of money. Or is it something you have a passion for or an interest for? That's one element that helps you set your goal. Now, there's another element to consider. What kind of knowledge do you already have? Because the knowledge you already have and the experience you already have and the skills you already have may lean you towards getting an instructional design job in a certain industry. Once you have that kind of leaning towards, you may want to study instructional design in a little bit of a different way. And then the other component is the technology, the tools, the uh, a portfolio. Claire had mentioned the portfolio. I'm very, very happy to hear that. When applying for a job, you know, I created a portfolio and it was a tremendous help. And trends, we're gonna be talking about trends in the industry. So when we look at these things together from a systems approach, instead of just saying, I'm gonna do some research and oh, I think I'd like to be an instructional designer and here's a job description and let me just get the skills and then do it. Instead of that, I'm suggesting that from a systems approach, you may want to factor in a lot of these other elements. So it, when thinking of an instructional design job and combining that with my skills and experience and what opportunities I may have, and then finding out what gaps they may be and what things I need to get, you get a more complete picture of what you need to do, not only to get an instructional design job, but to get a job that you'll be successful and happy with. Let me give you a personal example. When I first got involved in online learning, I had a lot of classroom instruction, not as a public school teacher, but I was teaching technology to adults face-to-face. -face. So I had a lot of face-to-face instructor-led training experience. After I got involved in instructional design, I had a challenge, a personal challenge. How can I be as effective when I'm training people online that I've been in the classroom? Because in the classroom, I could see when the student was lost and, and then we explain things in a different way. I could see if a student was bored and I needed to put out something a little more advanced. But how do I create online learning that can adapt to people's needs. Well, that goal, that vision, that driving question took me many years to solve. Part of it was because when I first got involved in instructional design, the technology wasn't available for me to do what I needed to do. One thing, the internet wasn't quite fast enough to put out a lot of multimedia. Another thing is, well, another big breakthrough when Storyline came out with the feature called Layers. Oh my gosh, I was able to use Layers to create an adaptive course. And one thing led to the next. And next thing you know, I came up with something unique in the field, what I call the Learner Intelligence Adaptive Design Model. And you could learn all about it from the Center of Learner Intelligence. It's not, now this is not a self promo, it's free information I put out. I've got nothing to sell. But the point I'm trying to make here is holistically, there was a lot of factors that came in into impacting my career as an instructional designer. There was the choice to go into instructional design. There was learning some skill sets, but my experience in the classroom, my ability to do a little programming with technology, all those, and this, this question, this challenge that I came up for myself, all turned into shaping my career in the industry. Traditional planning is kind of linear, targeted towards a job position, goal-oriented, where a systems approach is going to be more flexible, extensible, and open to change. And one of the benefits is if you can adopt a systems approach at an early stage, 
is instead of seeing things in isolation and you see things connected, you're going to see more opportunities. You're going to see more possibilities. You're going to be open for more change and better to be prepared for change than to be surprised by it. So here I have an action item. If you're in the career planning stage, number one, just shut down some of the things that are motivating you for in your in setting your goal to be an instructional designer. List the things that you have and list the things that you need to get. Is this going to be a tremendous difference from the traditional way of just deciding on a career and pursuing it? At this level, the systems approach probably is not going to impact you too much because you're just beginning to get into the career into the career. But I believe it will be helpful if you start broadening your perspective and thinking of other, other elements of a career position. With that, let's move on to level two. What if you are currently an instructional designer? Now, I've got a lot of logos up on the screen right here. And a kind of interesting, it would be kind of interesting to find out, drop into the chat how many of these items either you're currently using on your job or you're aware of and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm starting to learn this. So for example, we'll pick that one in the lower right-hand corner, JavaScript. It, you could just drop in the JS if you're using JavaScript or, begin, or planning on studying JavaScript. And I'm just curious to how many people are using, because every single one of these things I have on the slide, every single one of these logos, they're all involved in instructional design today. And if you have any questions on these things and we have time, we could probably take a deeper dive into these in the Q&A period at the end. Now, with all these things involved in instructional design, you may be thinking, oh, a lot of these things I'm really not familiar with. Uh, didn't I haven't heard of all these things? Like, is 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 the field of instructional design really is it that complicated? Is you know where is this headed? So when the future is uncertain, fill the need. And I got a bunch of words over here. Yeah, okay. So they all begin with an I, and they're all kind of related innovate, improvise, invent, inspire. But the point I'm trying to make is when things are uncertain, the words I put down here are useful in a bi-directional way. If you could find some way to apply either improvisation or invention or innovation to what you're currently doing, that very well could open up doors to you, but also flip it around and what things can you do when there's so many technologies and so many services out there what can you do what can how can you improvise to inspire yourself how can you innovate your own thinking to possibly see different things i'm going to give you an example because i this may be kind of hard to follow right now so let me give you an example in 2020, when COVID broke out, and we all of a sudden there's a massive shift of everyone going into work to working from home, working from home, that was a big disruption. And if you've already been in the instructional design field and you're very comfortable learning online, possibly attending UCI certificate course online, this may not have been much of a disruption for you. But for a lot of people in the workplace, it was a tremendous disruption and it caused people a lot of headaches, a lot of stress, a lot of problems and companies as well. You know, how do we continue communicating, not only in meetings, but in a face-to-face -face situation, learning took place in a lot of organic face-to-face -face ways. Now, how do we do continue business, continue the training, can continue the supervisation? How do we do this online? As an instructional designer, that was a challenge for me. How do I now continue to do instructional design knowing that people are going to be thrust into this online learning experience where they may never have on, learned online before? So I did two things. I integrated, first I integrated a chat feature. So now if employees were learning concurrently, they could chat with each other at the same time they were in the e-learning course. 
And I'm thinking to myself, well, this is one way where if someone hasn't been involved in this online experience before, just by saying, oh, there's, you know, there's Sue, my friend. It's like, hi, Sue, how you doing? It's like, what's going on here? You're having that little communication back and forth could be helpful. And then I thought to myself, well, why stop at chatting? How about integrating web conferencing, like the Zoom conference that we're doing right now, right within an e-learning module? And I go, that would be cool. Problem is, Zoom didn't allow embedding inside you know, the e-learning environment, nor did Microsoft Teams, nor did GoToMeeting. None of them did. I had to find a web conferencing software that did permit that. And I actually did a conference webinar on exactly that and demonstrated how e-learning can be developed with integrated chat and integrated uh, web conferencing. So here we have a situation where there was a challenge and by me thinking of the system. So what is the system? The learner is online, you know, probably for, for the first time. And how do I reduce the resistance to that experience and make them feel less alone. So that was, so by thinking outside of the box and, 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 and drawing upon my experience, I was able to come up with these solutions. The future of instructional design, if you're an instructional designer, is involving. It was about a year ago that I was looking for work. And as I was looking at job descriptions, I realized a lot of these job descriptions for LXD, a learning experience designer, that's what I do. I'm not, I don't just pick up a, a authoring tool and design the course. I'm thinking about the entire experience. I just shared you with, shared an example where the online experience of the learner in a shutdown situation inspired me to develop the, uh, online learning in a different way. But I also shared the fact that I did a little programming. So I always thought of myself as more of a LD, a learning developer. When I applied for my current job, I quickly asked for the title of a learning solutions architect because I have been thinking from a systems design approach for so many years that I take a lot of factors involved. And in my current position, ELB Learning provides a lot of different tools and a lot of different services to the e-learning industry. And when a prospect comes to our company, I'm very quickly asking a lot of questions because depending upon what the client is looking to achieve, depending upon the goals of the organization, different tools, different services, different work processes may be required for the best results. Why? Because all these different tools all these different work processes are interconnected. They work together. And a choice of authoring tool and a, church of, and, and a choice of delivery platform like an LMS or an LXP, uh, those decisions can impact each other. And then last, I have in the dark blue, the question mark and the exclamation point. So you can see the migration of instructional design, LXD, LD, learning architect, what comes next? I don't know. I don't know what terminology. I don't know what buzzword is going to come next because I don't know what technology is going to revolutionize our industry and become in demand. A systems approach for instructional designers is, is going to take several factors into consideration. Factors which, if you've taken any courses at UCI, I'm sure you're going to be familiar with. And I'm going to re recommend that you think outside the tool. Instructional design is more than just authoring a course. And I've already mentioned that already. A systems approach is going to encompass many factors. It's going to encompass an analysis of the learners. It's going to encompass developing goals and objectives for the course. What is the best delivery system? This should be familiar. If you're, if you're already an instructional designer, this already should be familiar to you. However, from a systems approach, you have to take into consideration possibly more things than you have been previously. For example, a lot of instructional design now 
requires some additional programming that's not included inside the authoring tool. And a lot of instructional design may need the talents of a graphic artist or an animation expert. A lot of instructional design right now is calling for a lot more than just putting out information. We're looking to, for data. We're looking for analysis because with that deep dive into data, we could provide a better training experiences. And then with AI and machine le learning is automation. There's a trend in the industry for the tools that we use to automate more and more services, taking more burden off of our plate. So on this slide, we're looking how long will instructional design job survive instructional design in italics in a different color because as we spoke earlier the job role of instructional design is something that's evolving and if it evolves far enough you won't even recognize it from what you're thinking of instructional design here today so on the timeline we can see that the tools are changing from being able to import a PowerPoint slide and give you a jump start to making tasks easier and easier. Before you know it, it's going to be every single person in high school is going to be an instructional designer, you know, on a certain level. With machine learning and AI, a lot of tasks are being automated, which brings us to the next level of what of how is the instructional design industry progressing? involving programming data, VR, you know, virtual reality, augmented reality. These things are available today. They're being used today. We don't know how much of an impact they're going to be. We don't know how much of, uh, 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 how much in demand they're going to be. And a lot may depend upon going back to your career planning. Where did I see the sweet spot? What kind of a job do, did I want to get? Some jobs may require more of these advanced features than others. So the action item for current instructional designers is build a career growth plan. Why? Because the field is changing. You know, list what programming skills you think are going to be in demand. And the same for the categories of graphics, data, automation, and how these things integrate. What do you need? to integrate something like a Zoom, like a web conferencing tool inside an e-learning platform. It is good to know, uh, just have a grasp of these things and not that you have to study every single one of them, but when you see this list, you could choose what items do I wanna learn. And I have highlighted here, some skills may be in other industries. So for example, I had a lot of classroom or face-to-face -face instruction that definitely impacted my career development and, and some of the things that I, I came up with. I did some website design, I had some website design experience. Having some HTML and CSS experience was a big help in, in my career. So if there's any questions on this, we can take a deeper dive later on, but that's the action item for this. Now, if you're operating at a higher level, as we go from each level, the systems thinking approach becomes more and more important. The learning organization is greater than the sum of its parts. Yeah, as we're gonna find out that there's a lot of different moving parts in a learning department. And I'll give you an example when I was working for Johnson Controls, a global company, multi-billion dollar company, and They've made some decisions and I'm scratching my head. It's like, who made that decision? Does anyone out there know anything about learning development, about instructional design? So the challenge in a learning department is how do you facilitate growth in a learning and development department? Meaning since the industry is evolving and since it is changing and a company has to train their employees how do you keep up with it all and how do you manage everything and how do you avoid something like this explosive disastrous decision i'll give you an example the company decided to switch from one lms company to another 
Now, I was not consulted. I'm a senior uh, instructional designer. I'm training people in the company. I've got a whole variety of skills. I speak at conferences. No one brought me into any of these discussions on switching to another LMS. Okay, above my pay grade, I understand that, no complaint. But the complaint came when they discontinued the current LMS before we were ready. And that caused us to have to, have to hire external, you know, part-time you know, help to do all the extra work that was thrust upon us because they pulled the plug before they fully vetted and fully tested the new system. We were saying, we, we had to tell them, you turned the old system off, th these things aren't working. Now we had to do extra work to get them working. Bad decision. Why? Because they were not using a systems approach. A systems approach for learning departments now, you see, involves a lot more. There, there's always a goal involved. Every decision involves an objective, in, involves a goal. But for a learning department, you want to factor in the people. If they factor in the people that had knowledge that they could use, like myself, they should have brought those people into the conversation. The process, you know, what is the process for migrating from one LMS system to another LMS system? That would have introduced the fact that you want to vet the old before vet the new before turning off the old. What tools are available? You know, there's a lot of LMSs that have some really cool tools, but they didn't pick any of those. And then data, what kind of data do we need to actually run the department and actually train our people effectively? Every element has an impact. So for example, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, people, how are you gonna org organize your instructional design department? Is it going to be peer to peer? Meaning every single instructional designer, uh, the goal is to have them have all the skills and the same skills as everyone else. So everyone has an equal skill set. Or is it gonna be skill based? where you say, in my department, I'm gonna have an expert on graphics and animation. I'm gonna have, another, have, have someone else that knows advanced programming. I'm gonna have someone else that, that could use multiple tools and always recommend the best tool for the job. And as a team, we'll be stronger because you have high-end specialists that could share their knowledge. The processes involved in a learning department. Is it, well, let's just uh, say, you know, we do uh, interactions, advanced interactions, and we just check the box. Uh, or is it whatever we do, we want it to be of quality? Or is it going to be, look, we just want to get this done uh, the cheapest way possible. So if I got a choice of three authoring tools, which one's the cheapest, it'll get the job done. So, you know, so these decisions are going to infect, uh, affect how you reach your goal. The tools, some, you can pick the tool that's easy, you could pick the tool that's powerful, and I could go on and on and on, but you can see that each one of these items relate and affect the other. For example, if the vision of the company is going to be proactive, you're gonna to wanna to pick a powerful authoring tool, you're going to want to decide how much data you're going to need, and you want to have a delivery platform that's not going to be behind behind the times, just going to be more more progressive, like including a learning record store. So, but if your vision is is to be reactive, then you could pick something that's of lower cost and a standard learning management system, and so on and so forth. So each each of these items are interrelated, and if you make a decision on one of these items without talking to the rest of the organization that's when you have explosive who made that decision. So the guidelines for learning managers is to remember that the learning department is a system. It always starts with your vision and your goal. So you got to depend upon whether you want to do high quality, low quality course. Include all personnel of expertise in the decision-making pro in your, uh, in your process consider long-term consequences, and confirm that the decisions support each other and the vision. Quick guidelines right here. Action item for you guys is to uh, define your learning system, identify the systems that are in place, identify the people, actually come up like with a 
policy uh, document that describes your system and that could be used to help you guide how you make decisions in the future, who you bring in. If you have a written document identifying the people and the skills in your organization and what the goals are, it'll help you manage more uh, a learning department more efficiently. So when we think uh, from a systems approach on all these departments, it, the systems approach gets progressively more important as we go from career planning to career development and learning management. And yet I have benefited from the fact that intuitively I've been thinking from a systems approach uh, all my career. And with that, let's take a look at the time here. We do have some time left, which is what, which is, which was what I was hoping to, to go over questions and answers. How are we doing in the chat, Claire? We are good. Let's see. Looks like we have a nice comment here, but I don't know about questions. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, please go ahead and uh, type those in the chat. I understand that all of a sudden, like thinking of a systems approach may be new to a lot of people. And like I was saying, for, if you're thinking about entering the career, it could be like, well, do I really need this? And it's not the question of needing it. You could decide on an instructional design career and take the training and apply and, and get the job. But Claire mentioned something interesting. She said there's a, there was a course for a portfolio. In my portfolio that I created, now, admittedly, I had many years in the field. But in my portfolio, I put examples of all different types of things I accomplished. And it, I wanted to, to give a portray a diverse skill set and show how I overcame many different challenges, whether it be with data, whether it be with programming, whether it be something visual. For example, a common challenge in instructional design when developing a course is how do I get all that content on one slide. I mean, I, I get it all the time where the subject matter expert is giving me a ton of stuff to say, and I'm thinking, hello, you know, there's white space, there's certain something called cognitive overload, where I can't dump everything onto the screen at the same time. It's not going to be engaging. It's going to be confusing. So we, we break it down into smaller pieces and we put in interactions with the user clicks and reveal certain content and things come sliding onto the screen. So there's a lot more to you know, just doing you know, the job of, of instructional design. If you're currently an instructional designer, you know, did, we did we not have anyone respond to that uh, invite to drop into the chat? Is anyone using those other items? And let me see if I can go right back to that because th th there's a good topic for discussion. We did have a question on that. Um, someone just asked, what programming language might you recommend other than Java? OK, other than, let's go back here. Yeah, we're coming up to that slide. Yeah, other than JavaScript, let me bring that slide up. I'm flying all there we go. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. I'm currently working with an LMS situation where in order to get re certain reports and in order to build more functionality into an LMS platform, we like for example, badging with it where an image comes up after after a certain amount of learning has taken place. In order to do that, that can be done using a PHP database. And then where the learning course pushes information into the database, and then we could run a, a, a SQL query, a MySQL query, and retrieve that information back. So having experience with PHP and, and MySQL, 
or you know, uh, that would be helpful if you want to get involved in the areas of pushing and pulling data. Um, then there's XAPI. XAPI is, has not really taken off in years. And the big stumbling block with that is that XPI is a coding format that enables you to track information on every single action that a user does, how long they spent on the slide, what they clicked on, what questions they got wrong before they got, before they got the, the question right, uh, which, what order did they take the slides. So all this information can be collected, but how do you analyze all that data? And there's 30 third party platforms that provide a learning record store and they'll house the data, but then there's dashboards to analyze it. We're not quite at the point where those analytical dashboards are readily available. And that I believe is the stumbling block to XAPI. So here, what I just mentioned is a couple of opportunities with PHP and we, we get becoming fluent in XAPI. These are things that are going to become more and more important as we go on in our career. Any other comments as I've been speaking? Another element here that I have on the screen, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is something that hints at a lot of impact on our industry and Python is something that lets you, you know, uh, uh, create those algorithms for AI. I'm not exactly sure if you're young, it probably would be a good idea to become familiar with the Python programming language. Uh, if it probably there's going to be tools that's going to automate a lot of the Python programming. So you may not have to be an expert at it, but I definitely think that for a company that's adopting a lot of AI, for you to say on your resume that you know Python programming, you're familiar with building some, some, basic, uh, some basic AI systems, that is gonna be beneficial in, com in combination with your instructional design uh, uh, experience. Now, uh, we also had a couple other questions here. Okay. Um, I'll just read it out. I'm wondering whether in the ID field, we will end up specializing more as time goes on. For example, there are now digital adoption platforms and job descriptions ask for skills in these tools. Also, a lot of instructional designers need to both design and develop, but there are some organizations where IDs design and e-learning developers develop. Uh, yeah, that's kind of, that's definitely true, which is what I mentioned earlier about the learning department, uh, th think of it from a systems approach because, and it also relates to when you're looking for a job. I've seen jobs where each person is, has a specialized function and different people have different skill sets. And I did not want a position like that. It's like, don't tell me I'm just a designer. Uh, or because I could do so much more. I was, I was already past that point. So depending upon uh, what, how you're developing your career, if you want to keep yourself specialized in one area, which I personally think is a little risky because one area can be highly automated and it could become easier and easier to do. I, at the risk of dating myself, I can remember way back when, when there was something called desktop publishing. Uh, now, a common word processor like Microsoft Word does 90% of what specialized desktop publishing tools used to do in the past with wrapping text uh, around images and putting images and multi-columns multi, multi of text. Typically, you need a specialized program to do that. So there's a little risk if you're young and in entering the field to pigeonhole pitch pitch yourself just into one specialty. It's better to embrace some of these other technologies. Any other questions? Yeah, we have, what do you think about the Sententia? Um, I'm not sure what that is. Sententia? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> 
Um, and then what do you think will happen to departments who will not evolve slash adopt to the future systems you talked about? There are companies doing that right now where they keep doing things the old way. The learning experience, as learning experiences get more sophisticated and more evolved, it's going to impact the learners. And here we get the systems thinking again, okay? So you're doing something uh, today and for the learner of today, and it's working. 10 years from now, there's this new technology out, there's these new processes out, and do you think the learner is gonna be the same? Because I, I was speaking to someone just the other day, a young millennial person, and I said, you know, I'm getting, my, I'm getting myself a 360 camera and I'm going to be able to do these virtual tours where you can click on things and say, oh, that's cool. You know, you know, that's so exciting. So if the learner becomes immersed and expects to have learning experiences that use modern technology, and I could just use the 360 you know, experiences as an example, if you're an organization that does not progress, your learners may not be satisfied with the training that you're providing, and you may have a retention problem with the employees, or you may have a competition problem in the marketplace if your competitor is using better training methods than you are. And that's a good question that, that, that shows you the benefit of a systems approach. Yeah, it looks like um, that, that thing we weren't sure send Tessia, it's an AISW, oh. oh, synesthesia. Okay, yeah, I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar with it enough to speak about, but I could tell you there is a LMS platform, very, very, very robust, very expensive, it includes a ton of things. And one of the things that interested me was when I read that they have a, the, a, the ability using AI to create and actually author e-learning on the fly. All you do is point it to a link or upload a document, it analyzes the document and builds a course for you. And now I'm thinking to myself, oh boy, there goes the instructional design job. AI is gonna, is, is gonna take a lot of people's jobs. All right, so now, then I tried it out and it's not threatening any AI job. What it does is it searches the document or it searches the URL, finds keywords. I mean, it's very impressive in what it does. And it'll actually create paragraphs of text and actually put them in a logical sequence based upon its data source. Then it, it searches for images related to those topics. So for example, if you have uh, excitement, as one of the keywords, we have an exciting new product here that you know that's going to wow you. It may put find a picture representing excitement. Someone really happy, raising up their hands and stuff like that. Party hat or whatever. And I'm thinking to myself, this is not instructional design. It may be good for elementary school where you could do something very simple, but when you're trying to explain the difference between a you know, software as a service from a mechanical device, and it's very esoteric and very complicated. You need to have images of the product. You need to have animations of a process. You need to have a deep understanding of the concepts and the AI is not gonna do that. So that's good, good news and bad news. It's the direction that we're heading in to automate everything and do, uh, and do more and more through analysis and algorithms but we're not at that point yet. So with the, with the AI, I've seen avatars with the, you know, speaking, very impressive. I've seen text to speech, uh, very, very realistic voices. Uh, and, but most of it has been on the automation side, not on the creative side. So if you're creative and if you could blend multiple technologies together, so for example, that AI example I gave you before with building e-learning, you could build e-learning with text and with images, but how do you know when you need to pull an external data source? Or how do you know when to upload uh, data to an external data source? So for example, on the 
uh, learner intelligence uh, website that I set up, you know, there's a link to a test drive of an adaptive course. And when you take that adaptive course and you can take it with your colleagues, it's, this, it's a very short, very short course and you go through it very quickly. But when you look at the results, uh, what I'm doing is I'm tracking the sequence of pages and uploading it to Google Sheets. So when you go to Google Sheets, you can compare your path to the site with, some, with someone else's path to the site. And when you have that kind of learner metrics back from your organization, you could learn a lot about your learners without putting out a single survey or asking any questions or putting out any polls. Learn how your users are using your training and then modify your training to cater to the way they're using it and make it much more efficient a learning experience. And I'll go back to the last slide with links and communication and stuff. Keep the questions coming. So the website I just, I just referenced is the, is the learnintelligence.org. There's, there's free, free templates that you could download. Like I said, I have nothing to sell there. How are we doing time-wise, Claire? Uh, we have just a couple minutes left. So uh, any other last minute questions, we'd be happy to answer those as well. Um, if you, you know, are thinking of something, don't quite know how to phrase it or, you know, sign off and something comes up right away, just go ahead and send me an email and I can forward that along to Dominic as well. Um, and we'll be sure to get an answer out to you. Well, thanks for having me, Claire. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much. We, I, yeah, I learned a lot. I feel like I can apply that in my life as well, that systems thinking. So fantastic. Yeah, if anyone has any further questions, um, please go ahead and send them to me. If you have questions about the program as well, I'd be happy to answer them. So thank you so much, um, Dominic, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And we hope you have a great day.